So uh, welcome everyone to our uh, PCS seminar. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker of today's seminar, uh, Professor Andrei Kalovsky from uh, Krasnoyarsk, uh, where he was born, uh, lived quite a time. Uh, well, I'll say more about uh, some part of his life, which he spent in other places, but uh, where he is now again. And if you watch closely, uh, into his the background, you will see some. Yeah, I am uh, home. <laughs> you will see some some hiking, uh, some uh, uh, stuff, and you will see also some skis. And the point is that they indeed want to go skiing somewhere in the nearby places. I don't know how far that is, and they also have to be careful. We were told uh, because there are lots of bears, and currently it's very it's cold summer. there. Uh, it's uh, plus twelve during the day although they had already kind of like some uh, a very, very hot weather in, in May, which very hot means plus 27. Uh, right, so uh, with this little weather report from uh, our speaker's place, let me say a few more words. So Andrei uh, studied uh, uh, physics in uh, Krasnoyarsk State University, and then he uh, was a, a PhD student at the Kerensky Institute of Physics, the very famous uh, uh, supervisor, Professor uh, Zora Zaslavsky, the late Zora Zaslavsky, who wrote uh, a number of very uh, excellent monographies, apart from all the uh, big contributions to uh, science. Uh, and uh, I was very lucky also once, uh, a few times actually, and once to host uh, Professor Zaslavsky back in Dresden. So uh, then, uh, he defended this. Uh, he also, Andrei also made, uh, defended a second thesis, uh, which in Russian is called uh, doctor, doctor thesis, and in, in the German system is called habilitation, and uh, uh, there are maybe other places where it's called simil similarly. So it's like a second degree, a very high second uh, scientific degree. He did that in 1995. And since then, he was, uh, he was, uh, moving around the world and he spent uh, uh, essential time in different places in Germany, in Essen, in Kaiserslautern. And then uh, uh, luckily for me, because that's where I met him also in Dresden for four years. And uh, uh, he, was, he also stayed for some time in Greece and uh, he visited our place here in, in Tejong two years ago, no, three, three years ago. Right. So. Uh, uh, aside of being a, uh, a researcher at uh, the Kirensky Institute of Physics, he's also a lecturer or professor, better to say, at, at Krasnoyarsk State University uh, or since 2006, the Siberian Federal University uh, in the same place. Right. He has a lot of publications, more than, uh, way more than 100, and uh, lots of interesting uh, uh, research uh, he's doing. We had uh, recently uh, also a joint publication a joint research work with uh, Andy, and uh, we are currently doing some ongoing work in directions which are related to these activities. But today, 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 where is my, yes, here it is. Today, uh, here is written on my uh, screen. Today, Andre will talk about stationary currents of bosonic carriers across some, uh, well, actually not some, but the flux from the lattice. Uh, Andre is, among many other things, a specialist in uh, ultra cold modeling ultra cold atomic gases in various uh, versions, both uh, using semi classical approximations and uh, fully quantum many body approaches. Uh, so we'll see which of this uh, we will uh, learn more about today. So uh, the virtual floor is all yours, Andre, please. And, and we should uh, welcome our speaker. And now you see. Again, it doesn't work. We should welcome our speaker with a... Yeah, I see. I hear. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I begin, right? Yes, please. Okay, so you see the title and the next slide explains the meaning of this time. So I shall wait two seconds. We check that the next slide appears with time delay approximately two seconds. So I hope that now you see the flux from the lattice. And uh, so 
What it is, it is a lattice which consists from rooms, which are connected into the lattice, and the term flux without going into physics simply means that you have the complex hopping matrix element. For example, it is from here to here, the complex matrix element is parameterized by the pi of phase phi, and from here to here it is the same but with the opposite sign. So the pi of phase is a total phase which you get if you encircle the room in the clockwise direction. So, how we get this is a different story, so, but our motivation as pure theoretical, so for the moment it's quite enough to know that this is a complex matrix. So the block dispersion of this lattice, as you know, consists of the slip ends, and one of them is completely flat. It's at zero energy, and the two other bands are dispersive, but changing the pile phase phi, you also can make them flat. So you see that for phi equal pi, so this is zero, and you have three flat bands. So I should mention that uh, this flux rabbit has been realized with photonic crystals, uh, but I not going to talk about the experiment, as I said, so my motivation is pure theoretical. I am interested in the current of the bosonic carriers, where the particles, some of the particles, come from the left zero R to the first side, then somehow propagate through the lattice and go out to the second zero R from the side, the last side of the lattice. And I'm interested in the value of this current depending on the pile phase phi or and the other system parameters like the length of the lattice or interparticle interactions. So um, before I am start to analyze this flux rhombic lattice, I want to discuss a simpler system, which is the open bazaar Hubbard chain. This is now just a simple linear chain. This system has been realized with cold atoms, and I hear that borrow the figures from the paper uh, of the Esslinger group in Zurich, who did this experiment, where one has a lattice with one, two, three, four, five sides, which the first side is connected to one reservoir and the last side is connected to the second reservoir. So, to my pity, they work with the fermions. But I am more experienced with the uh, bosons, so let us do so what we can do well. So, I have the bosons, then the Bazier particles, in this case called Bazier atoms, are well described by the Bazier Hubbard model. And this is the equation number one, where A and A dagger are the annihilation and creation operator. Index L simply labels the lattice sites. So in this case, capital L will be five. So this is the um, small oscillation. The next term is the hopping, which describes the hopping of the atoms from the one side to the neighboring sides, either to left or right. And the last term is the interaction. So this is the Hamiltonian of the closed by the Hubbard model, but now I apply, I attach it to the first and the last sides of this chain to two regions are, the left and the right. And what we have, it is called the open by the Hubbard chain. <clears throat> mm. The reason why there is a current is simply that the density of the particles in the left zero R is assumed to be higher than in the in the right zero R. And so you have a current um, maybe like um, like if you have two balloons, one with one density, the other half is a smaller one. You connect it by the tube and you have the current. So, but please notice that here you have no bias 
I mean, T is no bias, it is in atom, and this is simply because that I assume that the particles are, are neutral. Otherwise, there should be added a bias. Okay, so next slide, which describes the theoretical framework of the problem. Oh, sorry. So, um, the carriers in this by the Hubbard chain are now described by the master equation on the reduced density matrix. This is the Hamiltonian evolutions with the Hamiltonian given by the Hamiltonian also by the Hubbard model. And the last two terms take into account the presence of the left and the right reservoir. This one serves as a particle source and this one as a particle drain. Uh, well, and it is written explicitly I mean, that this is the source and this is the drain. And both of them are parameterized by the density. This is parameter N. Here is again capital L, but now it's been left. And for the right reservoir, it is capital R. So this is, this is the right reservoir. Okay, so... Um, you might be interested in the explicit form of this relaxation operator. Of course, they are in the Lindblad form. And the explicit form of this operator is borrowed from the other fundamental problem is physics, namely the decay quantum oscillator. So if you couple the quantum oscillator to a bus, you can find in many ten books equations like this one, where these terms gain and loss describe the particle exchange between the oscillator and reservoirs. Or oh, again, two parameters by two parameters. The density of the particle in the bus and the relaxation constant gamma. So it's, I would like to mention that actually these two terms, which contains many terms, can be rearranged in a different way. And the same master equation can be written in this form where now the physical meaning of the first term is the diffusion due to the effect of the reservoir, and the last term, this is the dissipation. So in this sense, the quantum oscillator, decay quantum oscillator, it's not only decay, it also usually experiences the stochastic forms of the size of the reservoir, which is kept in the account by this diffusion term. One more important remark. So this form of the master equation is no way uh, fixed forever. So it's not universal. And in fact, to justify this form, one has to assume a certain properties of the bus. In the other words, you should have a microscopic model of the bus, and then from this microscopic model of the bus, you should derive the master equation for, for the system of the interest. And this is a hard problem. At least I know the cases, and this is these references, where it is justified, but you easily can find situations when these master equations, these relaxation forms will be not justified. In particular, this is the case of the electrons in the solids. They should be completely different form of the Lindblad relaxation form. Okay, so I guess this is this mathematic almost all. So the quantity I am going to show you through the talks is the so-called single particle density matrix, which is defined according to this equation in the slide titled. Oh, this, is, this is reduced density matrix of the carriers, and this is creation and annihilation operator. The size of the, this matrix is obviously L by L. It is a square matrix of the same size as the lattice plans. Oh, and it suffices, if you know it, it suffices to predict the current. You simply, oh, let's say this is current density, you simply use these simple equations and calculate it. Now two examples of the single particle density matrix. So the left figure, 
is the case when they are attached to the first sides of the lattice reservoir and there is no, so there is a source for particles that there is no sink. The second reservoir is absent. So in this case, after some times, the single particle density matrix relates to the diagonal matrix with diagonal elements. And the diagonal elements of this matrix is nothing else like the populations of the sites. So essentially, the left reservoir in this case populate the lattice sites with the same population number or occupation number given by these parameters. That's all, the end of story. So, this example is the case when I attach the sink for the particle, and then you immediately see that you get the off diagonal elements, non zero off diagonal elements, and this is indication that you have a current from the first size to the to, to the last one, because current can be not zero, only if the single particle density metric has all diagonal elements. Okay, this is two examples. And, and they refer to the case of the non-interacting bosons. And remarkably, one can find this single particle density metric analytically. So in the case when you have no interaction, the problem can be solved exactly and analytically. The reason is that you can, if there are no interactions, you can obtain a closed set of equations for the elements of the single particle density matrix. Then you set the left side to zero to discuss the stationary case, and you are left with the algebraic equations which you solve and get the results. So here is the results. The populations of the lattice sites is given by the half sum of the parameter n left and l right. And for the current, the current is proportional to the difference in the, as expected, the difference between these two parameters. The prefactor is a kind of the itzaki dependence where for small gamma, current is proportional to gamma, but for large gamma, it is just proportional to gamma. So this is equation, and this is exact. Unfortunately, when you address the most interesting questions about the effect of the interactions, you cannot get a closed set of equations for single particle density matrix, and one has to seek for other theoretical approaches. So we tested several, and the best one is the pseudo-classical approach. So this slide briefly explain what it is. So the name comes from the fact that it reduces the original quantum problem to the classical problem for the L-coupled nonlinear oscillator. You use the wave transformation of the operator, obtain just Fokker-Plan equation, and finally, you essentially add with these systems of equation. So look on it more attentively. So this is the classical Hamiltonian of the bazaar Harvard model. It is essentially the L-coupled nonlinear oscillator. This is the coupling term between the oscillator. So then evolutions of each operator is given by the Hamiltonian equation of motion. And only for the first and the last oscillator, you have additional terms. So for the first oscillator, you have friction plus diffusive term. Here, XIT is random process. And for the last oscillator, you also have frictions. And okay, it was not enough phase, but again, the diffusive term with a random process. So this is what you have to solve in the computer, essentially. Then the elements of the single particle density matrix equal to these classical correlation functions. This bar denotes the overage over the different realizations of the complex random noise anxiety. So that's all. So essentially, it's a very efficient method for analyzing the problems with boson. And of course, you may ask the question how good 
how accurate should the classical approach at two hours uh, price? Andre, I have a question. Uh, in this equation seven, so uh, this is a correlation function between uh, measures correlations between different sites, L and M, right? Yes, and each site is associated. At the same time, T. So basically, if you would just uh, probably average uh, over time, it would be the same as averaging over the, the noise, isn't it? I mean, you can just take one noise uh, realization and average over time, isn't that the same? Why, why do you stress yes. that you average over different yes, one, When you come to the steady state regimes, that everything is stationary, then of course the, you can substitute the average of the different realization by average over time. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, uh, I wanted to discuss how accurate and in fact we were surprised because it is more accurate than we could expect. So this is, for example, compares dynamics of the only three side systems. The, this dash dotted line is the exact quantum simulations and solid lines is the pseudo classical approach. So the agreement is quite good. And the last but not the least, in Question the case now. of... Mm -hmm. okay, sorry, uh, what, is the, uh, what are the occupation numbers here, the average occupation numbers? If they are normalized to the occupation number of the left reservoir, so the density in the left reservoir will be unity. And uh, initially in this example, so the chain was empty. So the, sorry. But, but in the steady state, what, is, what are the ends? What are the occupation numbers on the sides? Uh, Here it is. This is almost the ends. This, this, and this. This is the occupation numbers of the sides. But in a quantum case, so you want to say that there are less than one particle in the quantum case on every? No, as I, say, as I say, they are normalized. In this case, they are normalized to the parameter n bar L, so the density of the left reservoir. If this parameter, for example, 100, then you should multiply this 0 0.6 100. It means that the second, which is the second side, no, this is the second, this is the second side. It is occupied with, there are approximately 70 bosons in the Right, okay. but 90, it, 70, 60. Mm -hmm. okay, is then this, this nice agreement also a holding? Is it depending on this uh, on this uh, average number of particles on a side? What happens this when you what, this is what we expected that if we go to the mean number of all those unity, we should observe large deviation. This is not the case, even in this case, there is very good agreement. So, in fact, you can work with pretty small occupation number of the order of one boson per lattice size. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. 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 This is just, I mean, a test of the Baza Harvard approach. And this is essentially the main result of the pseudo classical approach. The main results. So, this is, I have a lattice which consists of the 40 sites. And this is again the normalized occupations of these 40 sites in the case of the interacting atoms and non interacting. Or the particles, if you can see, mm -hmm. this is the same. So, uh, as expected, the parameters are like this one and L is one. So, here the first side essentially has the same meaning as the left is you are, and the last one almost the same as the right is you are. The view of the occupations, which is opposed to the non interacting case, where it is just in between these two lines. But the most important figure is this one, which shows the current as the uh, inverse lens. You can see that it decreases in inverse proportional to the lens of the Bazaar Hubbard chain, which is opposed to the case of non interacting particles where the current is independent of the lens change. Now, this is we come to important conclusion that if we have the vanishing interactions, we have ballistic transport between the reservoirs, and if we have the moderate interaction strengths, we have the diffusive transport. 
So when the current decreases, when the length of the chain is increased. So this is essentially the main results of this paper, which shows these results. And maybe one more remark concerning the pseudo classical approach. So it allows us to calculate a quantity which has no direct analog in the quantum mechanics, the so called the spectral density of the oscillator. So it's calculated like this one. Just you solve the Langevin equations with the stochastic driving and make the Fourier transform of the solution taken by the module square and over it it's over the different realization. So new is frequency. So it is example for the lattice by the Harvard chain of consisting of five sides. This is first row is non-interacting case. The row at the bottom is the interacting case. So by naked eye, you can see a quality of difference. And this is another indication of the transition from the ballistic transport regime to the diffusive transport regime. Good. Now I come finally to the rhombic lattice. Essentially, this is extension of the results of the previous work. So we simply repeat the same analysis, but now for, for this more, more, more complex lattice. And I begin with the uh, case of the phi equal pi and non-interacting bosons. So the master equation is the same, this is the same relaxation term. So let's see what we have in this case. So in the case when we have phi equal pi, the hopping matrix element to the C side to A side and from the C side to B sides has the opposite side. So when the reservoirs excite the C side, it excites the A and B side, but with different phases, which is opposite one. And the next C side cannot be excited because of the completely destructive interference. So essentially the current is blocked and the single particle matrices looks like this one. So this is the answer in this case, the current is zero. I be expected, mm -hmm. but in this case there is no current. Mm -hmm. Okay, next is when the pile phase is zero. So in this case, C sides excite, I mean, this hopping matrix element have the same side, and C sides excite A and B sides in the symmetric, say, symmetric superpositions. And then essentially the lattice behaves similar to the simple linear chain. So at least you have practically the same equation for the current. So it is the only this divided by two appears in the prefactor, the other, other same. And of course, this is a density matrix with this of diagonal matrix elements, which is responsible for the current. Uh, this is uh, only two cases. It can be treated analytically for arbitrary higher phase. You have rather complex dependence and moreover for short lattices, Uh, for short lattices, it also depends on the lattice sites, but if you increase the length of the rhombic lattices, everything rapidly converges to some unknown universal dependence, which can be approximately approximated by, by these dependence, like squared cosine function. But the exact dependence is so it's open question of what is the exact dependence. So, Again, what it is, it shows the current of the non-interacting bosons in the rhombic lattices as a function of the pile phase, which is proportional to the flux, mm -hmm. essentially. Okay, now come to the problems of the interacting bosons. And here we have your quite interesting dynamics. So the beginning of these dynamics essentially is the same. 
I now consider phi equal phi case. So the C side takes set A and B in the anti-symmetric superpositions. And then for some times, visual nothing. It looks like the current is blocked. But then you find that nonlinearity initiate a kind of the instability. And because of this instability, the anti-symmetric states decay into the symmetric states. So we detail in this recent blueprint, which just a piece is high. So and as soon as you get symmetric superpositions, so the next C site is excited. This C site again excites the next in the anti-symmetric superpositions. For some times nothing happens, but then you see that it's decayed to symmetric and so on. So this is the stepwise evolution is shown in this in these figures. This is population of the same time. So this time delay, time lag, essentially is the time which one needs the what instability to develop to. This is the way it's. But finally, you come to the some steady state regimes, and in these steady state regimes, you find non-zero current. And the last slide, I guess this is time, at least to mine, almost. It's compare the non-interacting case. This is these skills with the case when you have moderate interactions. This is larger than these ones by almost two times. So for moderate interaction, essentially what you get that the current is diffusive and nothing depends on the power phase five of the flux. Uh, Andre, to some, yeah, okay. Sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you. Uh, Merab has a question. Go ahead, Merab. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, could you please uh, return to the previous slide? I have a, yeah, I was confused uh, for a little while. Uh, yeah, um, uh, could you please repeat uh, what is going on here? Because uh, you have a phase difference again, and as you explained before, uh, this leads to no uh, current, but uh, in this case, uh, there is current. I, 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 maybe I missed something. Okay, there is. So I, I did. So temporal dynamics looks like there are no current. So again, so when this site is populated, it populates the A and B sites, but they are in the anti-symmetric position. So directly it cannot excite by this site, next one. But because we have interactions, which classically means we have non-linearity, after some time, this anti-symmetric AB state decay into the symmetric AB state. And uh, this is... Okay, thank you. Okay, and when it happens, it's like this one, then the next site, site is excited. And uh, we wait. Andrei, let, mm. Andrei, let me ask, let me follow up on this. So again, the, first of all, this is for the full quantum or for the classical calculation? This is pseudo-classical approach. Pseudo-classical. So uh, second question. If I but you can do full quantum for short lady sites like fine, 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 fine. but but this is mm -hmm. what you show here is for this uh, pseudo as you call it classical. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, do you have uh, noise and uh, damping on the A one and B one sites? No, only no. C sites. Right, these only then have good. noise Very and good. damping. Very, mm -hmm. Very good, uh, but you have nonlinearity on A and B. Of yes, course. right. Yes. Uh, but they are the same, uh, non, uh, I mean, the, exactly the same, right? Uh, non yes, yes, you. Yes, you. Mm -hmm. So then it's still surprising because if you start, uh, because uh, you would still expect that you have complete symmetry that... Uh, yeah, right. Or, or anti-symmetry, I should say, because whatever uh, arrives, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, the time mm -hmm. dependence on B1 seemingly should be exactly out of phase with A1. So why is that not the case? Because you add some little noise there or what? Yes, I guess that this is finally the effect of the little noise. But you know, so it's you, like... So, so if you start from precisely empty A1 mm -hmm. and B1, then nothing should go through? Formally, nothing. But okay. when you try to calculate it in the computer, even this round... Uh, when the, the computer takes a finite number of the digits, it should introduce a tiny noise. It is quite uh, enough. 
Yeah, but if you do it uh, correctly, I mean, if 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 you use yes, the same, you, same CPU, if you use the same CPU to compute the next uh, the next amplitude in time on A1 and B1, it will do exactly the same error and round off, and therefore mm -hmm. you would still get uh, complete uh, symmetry or anti symmetry. So but anyway, you, should, you, should, you should take some precautions. Yes, yeah. you should take some precautions. But any tiny noise, I mean, this. Anti-symmetric solutions, so it's tiny seeds of the symmetric. It can be 10 minus 20, but then it's exponentially develops and the anti-symmetric states decay into the symmetric states. Okay, thank you. Okay, I come maybe to the, this is last slide. The next one is the conclusions. So I simply want to some extent you can expect the results that in the presence of the interactions, you will have uh, you will have no dependence on the file phase. Uh, the arguments can be like this one. So interactions change the ballistics transport into the diffusive trapoise. Diffusive is associated with the uh, diffusion, and you know that any process which called diffusions it destroy any quantum interference, and so this is the result that the, this effect, which is due to the quantum interference, is destroyed by the diffusion, and you have just diffusive curve. Okay, this is a summary. You can read it, or I can read it for you. Let I read it for you. I guess I have five minutes left. So we analyze stationary current or bosonic current in the Baza Harbor chain of the lens. L, where the first and the last sides of the chain are attached to the reservoirs of the particles acting as the particle source and sink respectively. So this is my problem. Uh, the main theoretical framework is that analysis was carried out by using the pseudo classical approaches which reduces the original quantum problem to the classical problem for l calcot nonlinear oscillator. And as I said before, we were surprised that it works even for small occupation numbers of the order of the one boson per lattice size. So then it was shown that increase of the oscillator nonlinearity which is determined by the strength of the interparticle interactions, results in the transition from the ballistic transport regime, where the stationary current is independent of the chain length, to the diffusive regime, where the current is in US proportional to the chain length. We repeated the same analysis for the flux rhombic lattices. Of course, motivation was the effect of the flat bands. Uh, and because of this presence of these flat bands, the ballistic transport is prohibited for phi equal pi. However, the diffusive transport is possible and one has even non zero current for pi phase equal to pi. So that's, that's always concern this problem. So this is one of the directions, as I say, and there are many different formulations of the transport problem. This is a transport problem without bias, but of course, we also work with the case when you have additional bias. Thank you. So. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Andre, for this really nice talk. So uh, let's see if we have any questions, guys. Okay, maybe till the time others are thinking of a question. Um, so in, in the setup that you have, uh, have you looked at the symmetries of this model without you know, considering the, uh, the Bohr-Subbert interaction? Because uh, these generally lead to multiple steady states for these Lindblad kind of equations. Have, have you looked into these directions? Mm. Well, as concerned, uh, of course, so there are the other famous problems in the quantum mechanics. This is, uh, again, the decaying and driven quantum oscillator, where it classically shows the B-stability. Mm -hmm. And then you can do the quantum analysis with the pseudo-classical approaches. Actually, we did this 
it is completely reproduces the results of the quantum analysis. Yes. But in, in that problem, we have the driving of the oscillator by the harmonic force. Mm -hmm. This is this is the stability. Here, the driving is by the let's say white noise. Right. So we didn't find any stability. Mm -hmm. Okay. The stationary. Oh. Mm -hmm. So it's just a unique stationary solution that you always have. unique stationary solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I agree that there could be the case that you have a true stationary solution and metastable stationary right. solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have a few questions. Um, maybe Alexei first. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a very simple question. So, uh, can you, when, when looking at the current, is it possible to tell whether the uh, current happens by propagating single particles or they propagate in uh, pair couple? Oh. I'm asking no. that because exact, exactly at the point where the flux is high, in principle, single particle transport should be forbidden. Yeah, that too. So there is a work which shows that if you have two particles, it's already enough to destroy the localization. Uh, let me think how I can how I can answer your questions. Mm -hmm. This is surely not the single particle. I mean when you solve the original equations like this one, assume that I solve it exactly, I can do this for for some small systems, we have this reduced density matrices. And in fact this reduced density matrices has block structure. And each block is associated with the given number of the bosons in the lattice. So uh, essentially you have block when you have one particle, block when you have two particles, block when you have what, 10 particles in the lattices. So when this is the reduced density matrices. But then when you calculate the single particle density matrix, everything somehow some ups. So then you can tell only about the mean number of the particles say, in, in, in the each side or in general in the whole chain. I do not know, so does it answer your question or not? But you see that this is a problem formally with not fixed number of the particles. So then mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we don't hear you, Juzar. We don't hear you. I think I'm you sorry. Muted. I, I muted myself. Sorry for that. Yes, Merab. Sorry. Go ahead. Hey. Uh, yes. So I, I again uh, want to just uh, clear up the confusion uh, that I have. Uh, uh, when you speak about uh, pseudo classical approach, uh, is it the same as uh, quasi classical, or uh, there is some, mm -hmm. some difference? Because I, I don't know. Maybe I didn't hear this. Uh, no, this is different stuff. This is this uh -huh. is really different stuff. Mm. Well, it's known. I mean, not exactly, but it is known also by the name like the truncated Wigner function or truncated Hussein function. So this is essentially the same, almost the same. So you just from the uh, using the wave transformations of the commutator and Limbrat operator, you get the equation on the Wigner function. Then neglecting some terms, you transform them in the Fokker-Planck equation, and the Fokker-Planck equations, you find uh, the corresponding plant given equation. So this is this is how it looks. I mean, the, the, the theoretical chain it looks. So there is no, uh, it is not the same classics. Uh, uh -huh. So why, because of this, I always prefer to use to the classical approach. So, so as far as I understand, this is uh, uh, to go from uh, uh, purely quantum to Fokker-Planck first, and then to to Langevin, not not vice yes. versa. Yes, uh -huh. just from the from the master equation to Fokker-Planck equation, and then to the Langevin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Now, yeah, but have a look at, at the final equations, except for the two sides which are coupled to the two. Uh, uh, drain and uh, source uh, and sink. Uh, the rest is just uh, uh, in a Schrodinger equation. So, uh, I mean, yes, you arrive there maybe through a different route, but uh, it is 
what you would call uh, a classical or semi-classical, God knows what, how you want to call that approximation of your original quantum problem. So why making such a big uh, emphasis on that this is only pseudo but not quasi-classical? To me, it looks the same thing. Oh, With some well. specific way you, you, you drive uh, the two boundaries. Yes, you drive two hours. I agree that what is in between, this is no linear Schrodinger equation. This is true. Mm -hmm. This is true. But the important point that you have to have several different realizations. You run not the single trajectory, but different trajectories. And they may be very different. And you Sorry, take average. You by, okay, okay, let's talk about that again. So, uh, what does it mean? So, you mean different uh, noise realizations? Different noise realizations. Well, let me just run long enough. Shouldn't I see just as we discussed some stationary state which will be one and the same for any noise realization in terms of observables? With dissipation terms, this is true. So if you want to run enough, it's come to um, it's it's comes well, so if you only run single realizations, it hardly be able to do any conclusion essentially you really have to do averaging either over the noise realizations or maybe indeed in the stationary regime over a long time right so it's a matter of time simply i mean if you and the rest is just a matter of cutting okay. time and doing averagings over I am just want to stress the importance of this averaging procedure. It has to be there. And this is the difference in the semi-classical approach, let's say a pseudo-classical approach. Well, I'm still not getting that. I mean, you just, uh, we, just agreed, we agreed that, uh, that uh, this averaging can be an averaging over different noise realizations, or it can be an averaging over time. In the stationary issue. In the stationary using, regime. Using one noise realization but averaging of all. Uh, in the stationary regimes. But this allows you also to study the transient regimes. How T, I mean, the, the process goes in the transient regimes. Uh -huh. so, so you say, let's, let's, okay, uh -huh. so you say, let's uh, look at the transient dynamics. And that yes. one you cannot catch yes. with one. Okay, I, see. I mean, but if this, this figure is done for single realizations, you will see nothing. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. No, for the transient, I agree. Right, I understand. Thank you. Okay, um, Nana. Oh, excuse me, can you back to the slide four? This is four. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so NR and NL is uh, for this case is uh, for bus number one and the bus number two, right? Yes, this is the right uh, bus. Yeah. Oh, this is so, left bus. This is the right bus. Mm -hmm. Yes, but for the diamond chain, uh, what uh, what do you mean NR and NL? The same. So instead okay. of the linear chain, you have uh, the room. Is the A and B right? Yes. Yes, yes, it will be okay. like this one. So, so, so for the, for the all the simulations, why we always choose NR equals the half of NL? Mm. Say again. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for all the uh, all the plot, all the figures, why we always choose uh, NR equals half of NL? Is there some special meaning or just unread? No, there is no special reason for this one. There is no special reason for one. You can choose this zero, for example. It will be a perfect sync. So then it will be uh, mm, nice. I mean, the curves look nicer when you have this one close to this one, or this one close okay. to this one. Just for, for small differences between them. Okay, thank you. So uh, you use this uh, pseudo classical approach that transfer the quantum uh, problem to a classical case, right? So because of the nonlinearity, then everything uh, we cannot put something, we cannot get something analytically. So we use this uh, pseudo classical approach to get something analytically with the nonlinearity, right? 
so have we have we got some allergic uh, so is it possible to get some allergic uh, uh, expression for the uh, for different region, regime like uh, transport regime and diffusion regime well um, you can do some guesses some conjecture but no exact analytic i mean for if you have not zero or no linearity no i guess no no i mean if you really look for example for i mean for one trajectory of this stuff when you have okay. the non-zero non-linearity. This is a trajectory in the multi-dimensional phase space, and this look like the chaotic trajectory. It's, it's random. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so only so after averaging, you get some, 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 some nice dynamics. And mm, you can do analytic, for example, if you have a single oscillator, maybe if you have only two sides, but that's all, I guess. We see sides, this is no way to, to move to analytic. Okay, okay thanks. Mm -hmm. Alexei? Yeah, sorry, a follow up question. So, this total classical approach, uh, any are there any constraints on the interaction that one can use? So, you use the on site interaction, but for example, if I want to look at longer range, maybe next, well, nearest neighbor interaction, or perhaps uh, true long range interaction, are there any computational costs that would show up? No, only computational costs, but I don't think that they will be large. Essentially, it's this, it modifies you these hopping terms. And if you have modified these hopping terms, so this is the nearest, in, sorry, I mean, uh, you mean the interactions, you mean the interactions, not the hopping terms. Not on site interactions, but the, well, I mean, I, I am sure that it will work also in these cases, but I don't know what, what will be the computational costs. But one certainly can consider the case of not the on-site interactions, but site-to-site -site interactions. This Coulomb, I am not sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, Andre, speaking about uh, computational costs, can you maybe say a few words how computer, how costly the calculations were, which you presented in, I think, on page 16 or somewhere where you had some... Okay, no, well, then... Good idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, to run, I mean, to have, to see the dynamics like this one, I mean, it's a nice one dynamics, I guess, you need approximately 1,000 realization. So this is quite enough, 1,000 realization to see the results. And then everything depends on the lattice lens L. If you have the lattice lens 100, then the ordinary computer will run for let's say three four hours you mean uh, for all uh, realizations or just for one for for all realizations all of them right well otherwise it so, would be the very uh, strange computer. Yes, uh, right yeah thank you mm -hmm. so basically it's just you say you need 1000 re uh, realizations uh, of this uh, yes uh, Mm -hmm. of, of this noise term because of the noise term and uh, right and the rest is uh, just uh, the time you need to to run a nonlinear Schrodinger equation on your lattice. That's true and 1000 is actually quite enough to uh, get a good approximation with the single particle density matrix which is the main objects we study so then when you compare the quantum and calculate it by these methods so they are look very similar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any more questions from the audience? Okay, it doesn't it's look like... like so. Let us thank our speaker once again. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.